Okay, so we engage with our imaginations, the bridge between the heart and the mind. We learn to ask better questions of the, um, the Bible in, in general and the gospel specifically. And when we do that, we, lo, and, lo and behold, we discover that John is interested in things that Matthew's not. And, and Mark is focused on a part of Jesus' personality that Luke could not be interested in, in at all. And you, be, you begin to see in, in the perfection that, that is the scripture, you begin to see this beautiful uh, way that the, the, the image of Jesus is integrated. I mean, what would it be like if we had four identical portraits of Jesus? I mean, you don't want that, right? So, in, so we saw that John has this elegant um, uh, image of, of Jesus, the wisdom of God, the misunderstood wisdom of God, but nonetheless the wisdom of God. And... Um, Fairly unemotional. Uh, I think there's only three adjectives in John that describe the emotions of Jesus. And then we saw, was it Luke we saw next? We saw that Luke, you know, with his background, was very interested in the fact that Jesus had come to turn the world upside down. And, and he's very interested that there are people who should understand Jesus who don't. And, and uh, others that had no business understanding Jesus who completely understand intuitively what he's all about. So... We're going to look uh, finally at Mark um, uh, briefly this morning. Uh, I, I think it's fascinating that two of the gospel writers' mothers were followers of Jesus. Uh, do you think that's interesting? I mean, John's mother, uh, Salome, was one of the followers, but also uh, uh, Mark's mother, uh, who we, we read about in Acts, uh, her name was Mary, was one of Jesus' early followers. The, the, the church met, the Jerusalem church met in John's house. I mean, sorry, in Mark's house. We're talking about Mark now. Um, Mark is a remarkable uh, young, young man and uh, the perfect choice to write the first gospel. And it is, as far as we can tell, uh, none of the gospels are signed or dated, so we're doing our best here to figure out, uh, put the pieces together. But uh, almost certainly the gospel of Mark is the first gospel that's written, and it's a new literary form. There'd never been a gospel. Paul uses the word gospel, euangelion, the word for good news, which was actually sort of a Roman word. Uh, when when uh, uh, Augustus was born, we have an inscription called a preni inscription, and it's, it, it uses this word to announce the good news of the birth of, uh, of uh, Augustus. But, and Paul uses the word uh, about 70 times. But Mark is the first time we have a gospel. A gospel. And the scholars disagree on that. They disagree on everything. Uh, they disagree. They fight on this stuff all the time. That's why I'm so glad not to not be one. It's, I'm, I'm so glad to be a, a person who studies the Bible who's basically a banjo player. So I've got a, you know, just a banjo player. You don't have to be afraid of me. Um, but I, I, I think, Mark, uh, the, the, this literary form is new. It's not the copy of an ancient novel because it's, 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 a, it's the story of a person's life based on confession. And that had never, nothing like that had ever been written before. Not a biography, right? The Gospels are rotten biographies, rotten biographies. But they are perfect testimonies, right? Absolutely perfect testimonies. And Mark is the first one. And, and verse 1 of Mark is the table of contents for the gospel. Verse 1, the beginning of the good news of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay, the first half of Mark ends when Peter makes his confession. Remember, a gospel is a, is a testimony based on confession. The first confession is Peter. And what does he say? You're the Christ. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, second half, the Son of God. The second half climax is when, of all people, a Roman centurion says, Surely this man is the Son of God. So verse 1 is a table of contents, which I think is really cool. I love that kind of stuff. But let's talk a little bit about who is Mark. Uh, and he is an extraordinary person. He's connected to everybody in the New Testament. And you, 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 you fail to, uh, you take this for granted if you don't look at it. Uh, first of all, his, his uncle is... Barnabas. You realize that? That's uh, Colossians 4.10. Uh, Barnabas. And who's Barnabas? Uh, here's a great bar bet, great Christian bar bet. Who's responsible for over half of the New Testament? You will always win this bet. Nobody ever gets this right. People will say, well, Paul. Nope, 
Uh, Luke, no, 26%. Who's responsible for half of the New Testament? Barnabas. Because if we didn't have Barnabas, we wouldn't have Paul. Right? Because when no one else believed in Paul, Barnabas did. John Stott said that Barnabas believed in the work that God was doing in a man. And when no one else believed in Paul, Barnabas believed in Paul, and he took Paul to the elders when everyone else was afraid of him. And, and also, we wouldn't have Mark. So we wouldn't have Paul or Mark if we didn't have Barnabas. Because when no one else believed in Mark, especially Paul, right? We'll look at that in a second. Barnabas believed in, uh, in Mark, and they, they went on mission together. After they split, it's Paul and Silas and Barnabas and Mark. Um, and it, apparently... Mark and Paul heal that, that uh, division uh, later, later on. But um, first of all, he's, he's a cousin of Barnabas, one of the early, uh, one of the pillars of the church before Paul was even a, a believer. So Barnabas is his, his uncle. Uh, he is a disciple of Jesus. We have indications that he's not one of the 12, certainly, but he's, he's in and around, uh, especially when Jesus is in Jerusalem. The first time you hear his, his name, John Mark, is in Acts 12, 12. And, and think of it this way. When Peter, when the angel busts Peter out of prison, where does Peter go? He goes to Mark's house. I mean, think about that. He goes to Mark's house. And that's the first time we hear uh, that Mary is there and that she's the mother of, of John Mark. Um, some scholars think that he was the, uh, the man who had carried the water pot on his head in Mark 14. You know, Jesus said, follow the the man with the water pot. Some people think that was Mark. That's a huge stretch. Uh, other people think that, you know, the little story in uh, the garden where the Roman soldiers grab this young man and he spins away naked. Some people think that was Mark's little cameo. And I tell my high school students, do not read the Gospel of Mark. There's nudity in there. So I want you to stay away from the Gospel of Mark. So, so of course, they sprint to the Gospel of Mark. And yes, it works. works every time. So... He's, he, he has a connection with Jesus. The early church meets in his home. I would, like to, I would like to think that the Lord's Supper actually happened at his house. I can't prove that, but I really want it to be true. Uh, and, and finally, he, he, well, not finally, but then he's connected with Paul. Uh, we know that he goes on mission uh, with Barnabas and Paul in their famine ministry in Acts 11. Mark goes along. And we don't know why. Some people think, having grown up in Jerusalem, may he, maybe he had language skills. Uh, maybe he was multilingual in a way that Barnabas and Mark uh, might not have been. We just, we just don't know. But when they started going inland towards Perga, we don't know why, Mark said, I'm going home. I've had enough. I'm going home. And when they started to go out on their next mission, Paul was not very excited about that. Uh, and he said, we're not taking Mark. And that's when Barnabas, his uncle, good old Barnabas, stood up and said, well, I'm going to go. I'll go with Mark and you go with, uh, with Silas. So he's connected with Paul. He's, he's connected with Paul in Rome. We know that later on when Paul's in prison, their, their, uh, whatever their disagreement was, was healed up. And uh, so he's connected to Barnabas. He was, you know, he was an eyewitness you know, of Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem. Uh, he's connected to Paul. But most importantly, he, he is a disciple of Peter. That's what you got to know about Mark. In 1 Peter, uh, Peter refers to Mark as my son. And some people think that's an indication that Peter was sort of his spiritual father, that he had led him to faith in Jesus. We don't know that for sure, but it's, a, it's an interesting idea. Uh, and we do have a word uh, from the early, early church. Uh, let me read you our earliest word. This comes to us from Papias in 103. Mark, says Papias, became Peter's interpreter and wrote down accurately but not in order all that he remembered of the things said and done by the Lord. Clement, Clement of Alexandria in 150 uh, says that the early church, they come to Mark and they say, please write down the account, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, Peter's account of the life of Jesus. And, and we have this interesting, 2 Peter's 115, write this down, 2 Peter 115, there's this little hint. Peter knows he's dying, right? 2 Peter, this is his last will, basically. He knows he's going to die. And he says, I have done everything possible so that after my departure, you'll be able to remember these things. I think he's talking about his time with Mark, right? He's talking about his time with Mark. Uh, so so that's, who, that's who Mark is, an uh, extraordinary uh, person. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the life situation of Mark, which is fascinating. Uh, Mark was written, we believe, uh, 
people much smarter than me believe, uh, the, the occasion of the writing of the Gospel of Mark is the fire in Rome. Uh, Nero, you know, who was a nut, Nero is, uh, is uh, emperor. He had a few fairly responsible years when he was a young man, mainly, mainly because he had two advisors who were a very you know, honorable men. But uh, after he killed them and he killed his mother and starts you know, really becoming crazy, he decides he's going to build a house. First of all, he's going to rename Rome. Guess what he's going to name Rome? Neropolis, right? <laughs> and he's going to build a house. And his house is going to cover a third of the city. It's called the Golden House, Nero's Golden House. There is a hallway in this house that's a mile long. That's Nero. That's how crazy Nero was. Okay? Uh, and and part, of, part of what he had to do to build his house is he had to clear out some of the slums. And in July of 64, um, he, he sent soldiers in who set fire to some of the slums in Rome. And unfortunately, because of the, because of the it was a very windy day, um, 10 of the 14 distri districts of the city of Rome burned to the ground. It was a disaster. Well, there were all these accounts, and you can read about this in, in uh, Tacitus, the Annals of Rome, and in Suetonius. I really like Suetonius. If, if you're into Roman history, Suetonius is kind of the National Enquirer of Rome, Roman historians. It really is. It's kind of all the juicy stuff that's really interesting, you know, not, not, not boring like Pliny or something like that. So I strongly, I highly recommend uh, a Suetonius. Um, there's an audible version of it that has uh, that famous British actor reading it who, who played uh, Claudius. Can't really think of his name, but anyway. Um, so anyway. Uh, Rome burns, and people start talking in the refugee camps, and they say, you know, I tried to put my house out, but a couple of Roman soldiers stopped me. And another guy said, well, yeah, that's funny. I saw a Roman soldier throw a fire brand into an empty building, and everybody realizes pretty quickly Nero set that fire. And Suetonius tells us that Nero had, had to uh, reclaim his... Uh, his uh, Frag, already fragmented reputation, so he paid for the cleanup. Um, he, he tried to he, he lowered the price of grain. He tried to do everything that he could he could to appease the people, but he couldn't because the people realized that Nero had done that. So he decided, I've got to find somebody to blame. And guess who he blames? This little group, you know, probably you know just a few hundred, not very many Christians in Rome at this point. He's going to blame the Christians because he thinks, well, everyone everyone hates them anyway. He said, you know, I'm, I'm going to blame this despised group called the, the, the Christians. And Christian persecution happens. And there's a story, there are lots of stories of the persecution, but one of them that's particularly gruesome that sounds a lot like ISIS to me is uh, Nero throws a gar garden par party in the gardens of Messinus. And as the sun goes down and it gets dark, uh, people look around and realize that the, the garden is lined with crosses and there are Christians hanging on these crosses, and Nero sets them on fire to provide light for his party. I mean, it's gruesome, and he's walking around dressed as a gladiator, so he's completely crazy. So what you need to know is the first readers of the Gospel of Mark are these Roman Christians who are, who are experiencing, experiencing persecution, and Peter's telling the story. And what does he want them to know? He wants them to know, you are not going to experience any suffering that Jesus hasn't already experienced, okay? And that'll, that'll help put a lot of the pieces of the puzzle uh, together, okay? Uh, for example, I think I, told, I mentioned this the other day. Uh, let's look at a few examples of where the life situation is, is in Mark. Um, for example, Mark tells the story of, of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, and it's two verses long. Mark is not interested in this story. You know, there's no threefold temptation. There's no Satan, you know, turn the stones into bread. Mark is not interested in that. But he says one thing that none of the other gospel writers say. He says when Jesus was in the wilderness, he was with the wild beasts. And a lot of people think Mark give, only Mark gives us that detail because he wants his readers who are being thrown to the wild beasts. Um, he wants them to know that... Uh, they're not going to experience any suffering.
that Jesus uh, has not uh, suffered. Another unique story in Mark is in chapter 3 when Jesus' mother and brothers decide he's out of his mind. You know this story? You ever heard a sermon on this? Uh, Jesus is not eating. Uh, one, of, one of the particular interests of Mark is the fact that from, the very, uh, from, very, from chapter 1, Jesus' ministry is out of control. By that I mean he is so covered up with people that he can't eat or sleep. In fact, he's driven to the wilderness because there's so many people. That's why in Mark, Jesus so frequently heals someone and says, please don't tell anybody I did this. But they, they always tell. I mean, how can you not tell? And as a result, Jesus is so covered up with people that he has to flee. And so you see Jesus hiding in Mark, which is not part of my image of Jesus. Only Mark tells us when Jesus goes, uh, the, the Syrophoenician woman who asked for the bread, the, the crumbs that fall from the table, Mark tells us he's hiding up there. He's hiding up there. Okay? So, um, yeah, so many people are coming and going that they don't, they don't even have a chance to eat. And, um, and his parents, his, or his mother, thinks he's out of his mind. So why does Mark say that? Why is that only in Mark? Well, a lot of us think it's there because Mark's readers are hearing from their family, you're out of your mind. A, a Jewish you know, carpenter from Nazareth? You're going to give your life for that person? You're out of your mind. And Mark's letting his readers know you're not going to suffer any, uh, you're not going to have any experience that Jesus hasn't already experienced. Um, only Mark uh, in 417 talks about that some people will fall away because of persecution that comes because of the word. Only Mark says that. And you can hear the, the, situ the life situation. In 949, Jesus talks about the fact that everybody will be salted with fire. What does that sound like? That's the fire in Rome. And we can go on and on, uh, on and on with these, uh, these examples. So as you're reading through Mark tonight, uh, I want you to look for that. These, these are some other things I want you to look for, and then we'll look at one passage, and then we'll have the Lord's Supper. Look for the immediacy of language. Mark's favorite word is immediately. He uses it like 17 times in the first chapter. I mean, come on. Immediately Jesus did that, and immediately he did this, and then he did this, and he did that. It's a quick-cut movie, uh, and I think this is a result of the fact that he's basically, Peter is telling him the story, and he's writing it down. No birth narratives, right? We jump right into the right into the story of the life of Jesus. Uh, no little bit, bits and pieces of sermons like you have in John. You know, Mark is very bare bones. It doesn't mean it's, it's, it's less important, but it's a, it's a Steven Spielberg. It's the Steven Spielberg of the Gospels, right? It's all cut, quick cut together. The other thing I think, or one of the other things I think is fascinating about Mark is he does not have the agenda that the other Gospel writers have. Now, his agenda is that you believe in Jesus Christ, don't get me wrong. But he doesn't have a secondary agenda. You know, Luke wants to show that the world's been turned upside down. John wants to show that Jesus is the wisdom. Uh, Matthew wants to show, uh, give you your identity, because Matthew is writing to a group of Jewish believers who have lost their identity because they've been kicked out of the synagogue. Mark's not doing anything like that. He is simply telling you the story. You know, give me the facts and just the facts. So there's no sort of secondary agenda in Mark. Uh, I find this absolutely fascinating. Mark is very interested in the emotional life of Jesus. Um, and I think, again, this is Peter. Because who's on the receiving end of the emotions of Jesus more than anybody? Right, Peter is. And uh, being the pointy-headed Bible person that I am, I actually looked in all the Gospels and counted all of the adjectives describing Jesus' emotion. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> Matthew, Matthew uses six um, adjectives to describe Jesus. Uh, Luke, seven, and John, four. Big, long gospel of John, only four. Guess how many adjectives Mark uses? Sh short little Mark, 15. So Jesus is angrier. Uh, he's uh, more compassionate. And I'm, I'm going to read you a passage uh, that demonstrates this in chapter one in just a second. So Jesus, the emotional life of Jesus is very, is very much in the front. In John, Jesus is fairly unemotional. Um, uh, John's portrayal of Jesus is that he's fairly unemotional. In Mark, we get to hear Jesus' literal voice. How cool is that? Jesus speaks Aramaic to us in Mark. You get to hear his voice. How cool is that? Ephatha, right? 
Talith uh, Akum, you get to hear Aramaic. Um, and, and as I said before in, in Mark, the ministry is out of control from, uh, from, chapter, from chapter 1. So let's look at a passage in, in, in chapter 1, and uh, if I can find my Bible. And I'll try, to, I'll try to demonstrate some of these things to you. Gospel of Mark. Mark. John Mark. He's got a Jewish name and a Roman name. Marcus means hammer, I'm told. Um, so let's start in chapter 1. If you, if you don't have your Bibles with you, I'll assume you've committed the text to memory. Uh, let, me, let me read at 20, 29. Jesus has already relocated to Capernaum. Capernaum is Jesus' hometown. After he gets kicked out of Nazareth, as far as we know, he never goes back. And he relocates in Capernaum, which was actually a very good move. <laughs> a good move. He's, he's located on the oldest road in the world, and there's lots of people coming and going to Capernaum. Uh, as soon as they left the synagogue... They went into Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was lying in a bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. They, they, they call this lake fever. Some people think it's some sort of blood poisoning, or um, they, they got sick from the lake water a lot. So he went to her, took her by the hand, and raised her up. The fever left her, and he began to serve them. Now, I want you to see that was an incredible miracle, and look how unmiraculously it's told. He basically get, grabs her hand, and it's the same way he raises people from the dead. He says, get up, little girl, get up. No, no lightning bolts, right? No Benny Hinn, <laughs> be healed. That's not how Jesus does his miracles. Always points away from himself. Always wins praise for the Father. Nobody ever praises him when he does a miracle. They always praise God, and I think that's remarkable. So he does this miracle, and, and, and I wonder, when, when Peter describes the perfect woman in, in 1 Peter, I think he may be talking about his mother-in-law. I know a lot of you would disagree with that, but I think it's a cool idea. When evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing him all those who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. Mark's very interested in, in uh, the confrontation of demons. The whole town assembled at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. But he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew who he was. He does not want the confession of who he is coming from the lips of demons, right? So he says to, he says to the demons what he says to the storm on the Sea of Galilee in a few chapters, be muzzled. And again, there's no struggle. You, you have in Jesus uh, this disturbing presence in Mark. People are sort of afraid of him. Uh, the demons are certainly afraid of him. But uh, the disciples, when, when he, when he stills, the, stills the storm on the Sea of Galilee in Mark, the disciples aren't afraid of the storm. They're afraid of him. Mark says there was a great shaking, right, a great uh, storm. Then there was a great calm. And then there was a great fear. You know, you're in the boat with a guy who speaks to the weather, right? Yeah, and it obeys, right. And then they get blown to the other side of the lake and the, the gatherings, what do they say? Go away. We don't want you here. See, that's this disturbing presence of Jesus. And uh, Mark, Mark is interested in that. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, um, interesting, this is interesting trivia, Judaism. How do you know it's morning in Judaism? You don't have a Rolex, right? You have a black thread and a blue thread. And when, they're, when it's light enough that you can tell the difference between the black thread and the blue thread, it's morning. Isn't that cool? So that's, that's when this is. It's fairly imprecise, but it's all you got. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up and went out, made his way out to a deserted place, and he was praying there. Simon and his companions... Now, that's how the 12 are described in the Gospel of Mark. Who do you think is telling the story? Right? Simon and his companions. Uh, Simon and his companions went searching for him. They found him. And they said, everyone's looking for you. Like, what are you doing out here? This is awesome. We got a hit, right? And he said to them, 
Let's go to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. That's why I've come. I've not come to, to, to draw the biggest crowd possible. Uh, in fact, the, the huge crowds kind of work against the ministry if you read the Gospels carefully. So we went to all of Galilee preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. And here's, the, here's the passage I want to look at. There was a man with a serious skin disease. He came to him on his knees begging him, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Now, in, in Judaism, it, it was said, it's more difficult to cleanse a leper than to raise the dead. So this is a really big miracle, right? Here's the emotional Jesus, moved with compassion. So we start with that, move with compassion. And that's a, an old Greek word that comes from classical Greek that, that it's, it, it's based in the idea of a horse snorting. Have you ever been sitting on a horse and they snort? And this, sh this shudder kind of goes right down their backbone and you're sitting on them so you kind of get... <laughs> that's the word. He, he, King James, he was moved in his bowels, which doesn't really work so well anymore, right? <laughs> I've translated this way. He shudders. He shudders. He smells this man and he sees this man. It's not just his body that needs healing. It's his life that needs healing. And Jesus just shudders. Oh, okay, so there's the first emotion. He shudders. Uh, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I'm willing, be made clean. Immediately, there's Mark's favorite word, immediately the disease left him and he was healed. Almost incidental. And by the way, that's the first time a clean person has touched an unclean person and the unclean person became clean because usually the flow goes the other way, right? Jesus just reverses the flow, as it were. Um, then, okay, formerly he's, he's shuddering with compassion. Then he sternly warned him. He gets mad. And this is HCSB. It says, sent him away. But in the Greek, it's he drove him away. And it's the same word that's used of driving out demons. So he gets mad. And he drives, get out of here. Now, he's not mad at the man, I think. He's mad at the situation over which he has no control. Because what is this healing going to mean? It's going to mean that he's so covered up with people who just want healings and to be fed that they, they're not willing to listen to what he has to say. That's why I've come, he said. Let me go preach there too. That's why I've come. So he gets kind of mad, drives him away, and wants telling him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer what Moses prescribed for your cleaning as a testimony to them. Yet... He went out and began to proclaim it widely and to spread the news, because that's what people always do, with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but he was out in deserted places, and they would come to him from everywhere. That's the end of chapter 1. And the rest of the ministry of, of Jesus in Mark, he is covered up with people. They, they, they don't want him. They want his gifts. And just let me say this in closing. One of the things that I love about this fascinating man is that he knows he's not his gift. Now, he's got pretty, pretty good gift set, right? Raising people from the dead, not too shabby. <laughs> pretty good gift set. But he always points away from his gifts to the Father. He always wins praise for God when he exercises his gifts because Jesus knows he's not his gifts. Okay, application. I'm not very good at application, but I'm going to do it. Um, this is a room full of very gifted people. I mean, incredibly gifted people. But I think, uh, biblically, the Bible would say to you this morning, you are not your gift. You are so much more than your gift. And like Jesus, we're called to give ourselves. My father was a doctor. Uh, he practiced medicine up until his, in his, into his 80s. He was forced to retire, and he died in six months because he could not imagine not being a doctor. My dad thought he was his gift. My mother had a hospitality gift, which meant when you came to our house, there was always a casserole between you and her, right? <laughs> but when my mother couldn't exercise that gift of hospitality anymore, when she became old, she became kind of a non-person. Never knew her grandchildren, was just couldn't do her gifts, so she was sort of, she sort of checked out. 
So let me encourage you, just plant this little seed in, in your mind. Exercise your gifts. Thank God for your gifts. But you are not your gifts. Uh, you're, you and I, are, we're here to give ourselves. That's what Jesus does, right? He heals people and then he introduces himself to people. He heals people who then hide in the crowd and he goes and finds them like the woman who touched the fringe of his garment. She's hiding. He finds her and introduces himself to her because he's here to give, to give himself, okay? So thus endeth uh, the lesson.